Right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show, and then it is posted onto our website later for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where we um, have all those, um, where our website is and where all those archives are. Both the live show and the recorded archives are free and open to anyone to watch. Uh, so I know today on our um, registered uh, um, people who registered for today's show, we've got people from all across the country and even a couple of people from Canada. Welcome Canadians. Um, we're happy to have you here. <laughs> um, so please do share um, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think may be interested in any of the topics we have um, on the show coming up on our schedule or in any of our um, um, archives, the history of the show. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, uh, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products that we think libraries might be interested. Basically, our only criteria is this, something for uh, libraries. Um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for libraries, so we do training, consulting, and work with all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show that have to that are for uh, K-12 schools, academics, publics, corrections, museums, um, anything that's a library we would potentially be involved in. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do uh, sessions for us here on the show for things that we're doing locally here in Nebraska, but we do bring in guest speakers. And um, that's what we have on the line with us today. We actually have two people on the line. One has camera and one does not. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about uh, small libraries running code clubs for kids. And we're going to start with Luke Miller, who is from Prendo, who's a company that's doing this with libraries. So I'm just going to let you take it away, um, Luke, and then... Um, uh, when you get to that point, you can introduce Jeannie and what she's been doing here at our um, O'Neill Public Library here in Nebraska. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, Krista. I'm really excited to be here. Um, for for the rest of you out there, guys, Krista is a pro. She knows what she's doing. Um, <laughs> I've done a, a fair amount of these webinars, and I don't know anybody who's more put together than Krista in the webinar world. So, Thank you. Oh, well, we've yeah. been doing Encompass Live's been around since 2009, so we've yeah. been here. Amazing. Yeah. An honor to be on the show. I'm excited to share with you guys. The truth of the matter is that the the real um, star of today's show is Jeannie, uh, and we're going to let her share her story about running a code club in a very small, uh, very rural library in a little bit here. I'll work my way through um, what might be the more boring stuff, and, and we'll just uh, highlight Jeannie and let her share her story because she's amazing, and you're going to really like her, and, and she's she's the star of the show today. Um, so, um, with that in mind, I want to just start off today with a question and um, kind of get the, the relational juices flowing. We're coming in from all around the country. I saw some people in Washington. We got some people in uh, Prescott, Arizona, which I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, so kind of home turf there. So, let's start off with this question and go ahead and use that chat or, or the question feature in the webinar software and uh, shoot in your answer. What's the last book you read? or are currently reading? Okay, this is probably a normal library question for you guys. What's the last book you read or are currently reading? So jot mm -hmm. that in the question. Crystal will read some of them out um, yeah. and we'll just build a little community as we get going this morning. Absolutely, yeah, go ahead and type it in. Um, I can tell you what I'm in the middle of reading right now. My husband and I both got started reading um, Mortal Engines, the, oh, nice. that, yeah. the book series that that recent movie was put yeah. out. We watched the movie and then both wanted to read the whole series. He's already through almost, I think there's four of them. And I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's very cool. All right, well, um, what else is coming in there? So we got Number of the Stars, uh, yeah. Pet Cemetery. awesome new movie yeah. coming out. Too. Rosemary's Baby. Cool. Oh, okay. Um, nice. Astrophysics for people in a hurry. Nice. <laughs> um, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Uh, that sounds like a, a <laughs> youth or children's librarian. <laughs> uh, Hearts on Fire. Okay, let's just do a couple more. Yeah, and then um, sometimes it's a, a, a young adult novel, Mirror, Mirror, A Twisted Tale. Ooh, Altered Carbon, also a great book uh, that became a great series. I'm hoping for the next season to come out, Altered Carbon. Yeah. yeah. 
Sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, a lot of cool books in there. Um, I just started audiobook using my uh, Hoopla app yesterday, uh, last night, uh, a book called, um, what's it called? The Divine Dance. And it's a religious nonfiction from a uh, Catholic friar, I guess he is. And I'm not Catholic, but you got to love those bunks. They're, they're just <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> I'm really enjoying it so far, The Divine Dance. Um, yeah, uh, that's awesome. You, you guys, this is a good group. I'm excited to spend some time with you. Let's keep going with another question um, here this morning. On a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you with coding? And if you don't know coding or computer programming is another word for that, that's um, like making a computer do what you want it to do. It's like HTML, JavaScript, CSS for kind of website stuff. There's Python, there's all these different languages out there. You may have done it back in the day with like C or C plus or something like that. Um, so there's lots of different types of coding, but on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you with coding? Let's say one is like, uh, I have nightmares uh, coding. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm terrified of it. It keeps me up at night. And let's say 10 is I'm secretly a tech billionaire, right? I, I just do the library thing because it's my passion project, but really I'm a, a tech billionaire. So where on that scale do you fit? And go ahead and, and plot yourself. All right, so yeah, we've got, um, most people call falling below five. We've got one eight. Um, uh, out of, out of three. Yeah, uh, someone's a four to five, a five, a three, two, uh, one, a one or two, four, four, five. So we're right. on, oh, most people five or on the low side. Right. Yeah, sounds that sounds about right for, for library land. You know, I, um, I put I've myself been, at about a five. I can do HTML. Everything else, I could probably fake it, but it's scary. <laughs> yeah, and Krista, how did you learn HTML? How did that come about? Tell us the story. I, but well, because I had to know how to do it when I first started in libraries, uh, um, there weren't, you know, the easy peasy software program that it's just, you know, make it look, you know, like what you want it to look like. You had to know the code to create and make your websites. So you were doing websites back in the day. Oh yeah. I, I my first um, library job was in at a university library in, um, I'm trying to think here, 1991. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Yeah. We're, yeah, we had to do things from coding scratch, yeah. Okay. But I was just doing websites. That's yeah. the only kind of program programming coding that I got into. I started doing the with the Hour of Code mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. I ran through that, but that was like a one-shot thing for fun. And yeah. I didn't yeah. continue on. Yeah, that, so, Chris, I'm glad you shared that. You're actually a, a great example of what's normal in library land. Yeah, I've, I've trained hundreds and hundreds of librarians on how to run Code Club, and most of them are just like you guys. They're like, oh, on a good day, maybe a four, right? Uh, I, I did a little bit of HTML in library school um, because I had to, or, or I, I manage our library's website, but I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm faking it most of the time. And so they put themselves somewhere in that one to five range, and that's pretty normal. To see an eight is abnormal, so whoever the eight is, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to hear your input as we go today. Um, but yeah, this is this is the normal plight of librarians. Um, we know that coding is important. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But how the heck are we going to run coding programs at our libraries if we don't feel like we're an expert, if we don't feel like we're competent at it? Um, so let's go ahead and just talk about why. Why is coding important? Why is this something we should even care about at our libraries? There's no shortage of stuff that we ought to be doing with our libraries, with our time, our energy, our resources, our money, all that stuff. There's no shortage of stuff. So why should coding make the cut? Um, I love to start with this quote, coding is the closest thing we have to a superpower. It's from Drew Houston. He's the founder and CEO of a company called Dropbox. If you don't know, Dropbox is uh, it's a super boring company. They do online file storage. So they have like those little folders and you click into it and you can upload your, your files. And that's all they do. And they're a billion dollar company. So he, for him to say coding is the closest thing we have to a superpower is a very compelling statement. And we at Prenda, we think of these superpowers in kind of two 
categories. First, there's the jobs category, super job uh, powers, and then super life skills powers on the other side. Let's talk a little bit more about both of those. On the jobs front, you can make a really compelling argument today about why we ought to be teaching kids how to code. The statistic is, is that there's going to be a million unfilled computer programming jobs by the year 2020. That's next year, folks, and that's not a million total jobs. That's a million jobs that they can't find enough people to fill. That's a million jobs. And so in small towns all around the country, um, collectively, we're kind of scratching our heads and we're, we're thinking, what are these kids going to do for work in the future? You know, there's only so many cashier jobs at the Dollar General. And what are the rest of the kids going to do for work if, in the future? And the answer is, if we can teach them how to code, they're going to be guaranteed a good job for the rest of their life. These jobs aren't going away anytime soon. These are high paying jobs uh, as well. Uh, I think the median national salary for an entry level computer programmer is somewhere in the neighborhood of $75,000 a year. Now I know you librarians, you make three or four times that uh, regularly, right? So 75,000 may not seem like a lot to you, but for us normal people, $75,000 a year is a big deal. So these are good high paying jobs and by running a code club, by giving kids the opportunity to learn these skills, um, you are literally opening up this door that they wouldn't have an opportunity to walk through otherwise. Why wouldn't they have an opportunity to walk through it? Because nobody else is teaching it. The statistic says that one in four schools offers any kind of computer science uh, curriculum or program in their school. One in four, 25%. That's terrible. Um, considering that this is such an in-demand skill set, this is the future of the economy and working and all that stuff, one in four schools. So how are the kids going to learn how to do this? The library. Just like it's always been, the library is stepping up to fill this role where in society where people need to learn skills and get equipped to get the jobs and to improve their life, the library steps in and offers uh, these kinds of programs. And it's happening, and we'll share more about the story that's happening around the country um, as we go today, but it's a compelling argument. Jobs, by running a code club, you're gonna give kids the opportunity that they would not have had otherwise. So it's huge. But it doesn't matter if these kids go on and become professional computer programmers. It doesn't matter if their job title says programmer. In the future, you're gonna have to know how to code at least a little bit. It's already happening for most of us, right? It doesn't matter if you're in sales or marketing or uh, customer service or whatever field you're in or a librarian, right? You're gonna have to know how to code at least a little bit. You're gonna have to interact with code. You're gonna have to customize software. You're gonna have to get your hands into it and know how code thinks and work through some of these if then statements if you want to succeed in your job in the future. It doesn't matter what your job title is. This is the way of the future. Uh, here at Prenda, we talk about it like the new literacy. Coding is becoming more and more just a baseline skill that every human is going to have to have if they want to succeed in the future. Now, traditionally, we think that you have to be a genius or some special uh, type of nerd if you're going to learn how to code or if you're going to be a good coder. But what we're learning right now is that's not true. Anybody can code. Uh, if you can do addition and subtraction and maybe a little bit of multiplication, you're going to be a, a, a pretty decent coder. Um, and that's all you really need to know to, to, to learn how to code. So it doesn't matter in the future what your job title is. You're going to have to know how to code at least a little bit. But what about that other bucket that I talked about? Job stuff aside completely, let's talk about life skills. Um, learning how to code is going to give you some really valuable life skills, just like youth sports or youth music programs. Those give you life skills, um, it, but it's a different set of life skills. If you think about sports, you learn how to win well and lose well. You learn how to not give up when it's hard. You learn how to work as a team. All of those are really valuable. But in coding, there's a slightly different set of life skills for, for this stuff. Um, number one, you're going to learn computational thinking. Computational thinking is a huge buzzword in the education world right now. Uh, it, it basically means problem solving, critical thinking, uh, rational thinking, those kinds of things. It means being able to think sequentially from top to bottom in like an order of operations. And this is a, a life skill 
that you can apply. I mean, what a life skill just means you can apply it to all different areas of your life, right? So computational thinking, if you uh, obtain this skill, you're going to succeed in tons of different areas in your life. And learning how to code is a, 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 an amazing way to gain this life skill. Um, why is it? Why why do you become a better problem solver when you learn how to code? Um, because you encounter a lot of problems when you're learning how to code. You get stuck every 10 or 15 seconds. And I, I, mean, I know Jeannie can attest to that, um, but that's the normal uh, mode for learning how to code. Getting stuck, uh, like hitting up against that wall and, and learning it and working and overcoming that obstacle as uh, you continue to put in effort. Next, uh, life skills. You're going to you're gonna be exposed to other STEM subjects. You're going to be exposed to science and engineering and math, and you're going to get interested in that stuff just by learning how to code and the nature of what the coding world is like. Additionally, digital literacy, that's just normal like computer stuff, clicking, typing, Googling stuff, copying and pasting, all of that stuff. Uh, by learning how to code, the, these kids are going to be forced in a fun way to, to level up in their typing skills to level up in their Googling skills. And it's awesome to give them a fun opportunity to get better at that stuff. Uh, additionally, when you learn how to code, you're learning how to learn. You're actually teaching yourself. In our code clubs, what we're gonna teach you in our model as we go throughout our time today uh, is that this is a self-learning environment. You're not there to be the expert. Uh, instead, the kids are teaching themselves how to code. And when they teach themselves how to, to, to do something, that they can then apply to the rest of their life. I expect that the kids who are coming up in Code Club today, when they're 60 years old, they decide on a whim. They're like, you know what? I want to learn how to play the cello this year. And so they're like, all right, I, I, all right, I know what to do. I'm going to start Googling it. I'm going to watch YouTube videos or probably at that point in 60 years, it'll be like you hologram videos or something like that. And they'll like, all of a sudden they'll start learning how to play the cello. And in a year, they're gonna be pretty proficient at the cello because back in Code Club, they learned how to learn. The maker mentality, that just means that you, these kids in Code Club and so much of computer programming is like dreaming up something, using your creativity to like dream up something that doesn't exist today and then making it. You actually go and build it in the software. And a couple rounds of that, a couple rounds of a kid having that idea and bringing it to the real world, it's gonna like catch like fire and they're gonna get so excited about making stuff. They're gonna, they're gonna believe that any idea they have, they can bring to the real world. So I expect that these kids in the future, they're gonna be the ones who are uh, making new inventions. They're the ones who are gonna be starting new businesses and nonprofits and changing the world because they develop this maker mentality in a code club at your library. And then lastly, relationship skills. In an increasingly digital world, any opportunity that we get to put kids in the same physical room and any opportunity we get for them to like look eye to eye and to solve problems together, to collaborate together is a huge win. We need to give kids these relational opportunities where they can form friendships, solve problems and collaborate together. And that happens in our code clubs. We call it club for a reason, right? It's not code class, it's not code learning session. I don't, it's code club because club indicates that like social, communal, uh, fun, optional uh, environment. And uh, in that space, some really amazing things can happen. So I, it doesn't matter which side of this you get excited about, whether it's the jobs uh, category or the life skills category, coding, in libraries is going to make a serious impact on the kids in your community, like a serious impact. And I, I think some of the stories that Jeannie might share today will demonstrate that. Um, and it's it's exciting. Um, so, like I said earlier, uh, coding's not just for the super nerdy. Coding's not just for the rich and affluent in the suburbs. Coding is for everybody. It's for small towns, it's for suburbs, it's for uh, urban cores, it's for girls, it's for boys. Every single kid is gonna be impacted for good by learning how to code at your library. And that's the why, that's why we do this. That's why Prenda exists. Um, I'll tell just a little bit of our story and then I'll hand it over to Jeannie and let her tell a little bit of her story. But we started in 2013 here in Mesa, Arizona, 
uh, just as volunteers at our local library, at the Mesa Main Library, which is just a couple minutes from here. Uh, and we started as like we, we, we had young kids like eight, nine years old. And we said, hey, what if we taught our kids how to code? We know we want them to learn how to code. But what if we invited the, the neighborhood kids to come too? And so we went to the library and said, hey, we want to start this like coding thing. Um, can we use some space? And they said, sure. And they like led us upstairs to this room in the back corner. I think every library has one of these rooms. It, kind of has that weird smell, you know, that uh, some of these library rooms can have. But they said, here, use this room in the back corner upstairs out of the way and do your coding thing, whatever coding is, right? And so we started it and all these kids started coming and we did everything wrong at first, as you can imagine. Um, but eventually we started to figure it out and it blew up. We had 40, 50, 60 kids come in every week to learn how to code in our public library. And we were just volunteering at that time. Um, all of a sudden we had all these other librarians from the area start to like call us up and come over to our code club and say, hey, Luke, Kelly, guys, you wanna come and like run a code club at our library? And we were like, yeah, that'd be great, except we have day jobs and we're just doing this like for fun as volunteers. How about you go run a code club? And that's when we started to learn the psyche of librarians. And the librarians were like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no way, I'm not gonna run a code club. I don't know how to code. You're crazy if you think I'm gonna run a code club. So we decided, okay, we, 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 we began to understand the mission. We began to understand the impact and we got super passionate about making a difference on kids around the country. And so we said, all right, what do we need to do to enable any old librarian to run a code club in their library? And that's when we started to do the training stuff that we do. And we have this whole training program that's really fun and powerful. We wrote some really simple software that, that will lead the kids through a learning journey. And so we have the software component and then we just do a lot of coaching. And we spun it up. We got a couple big grants from the Arizona State Library, the Utah State Library back in 2015 or 2016. Uh, and that's when we decided, okay, we're doing this. We quit our day jobs and we're doing it now. And we're still small and scrappy and finding our way, but we're making an impact. And um, I think at this point we're in uh, like over 200 libraries around the country. We've trained over 500 librarians on how to run code clubs. We've had over 15,000 kids come through the program. So we're at a point where the model, it works. We're, I'm confident the model works. We're adding new libraries all the time and the model works. It actually enables any library to run a code club. Now I'm gonna teach you the model today. And if you're so inclined at the end of today, you will actually be empowered to go and start your own code club on your own. Um, uh, so that, that's something to look forward to. Um, let's see, anything else about the Prenda story? Oh, I'll share one thing um, and I'll share more about it a little bit later. But last year in 2018, we won a grant from IMLS um, that we called Code Club in Small and Rural Libraries. Real like catchy name, right? Um, so Code Club in Small and Rural Libraries, it was basically a grant to run code clubs in 50 of the smallest and most rural libraries in the country. So we had 50 spots, we had over 350 applicants uh, who were interested in this. Uh, we, we could only take 50. We're partnered with North Dakota State Library on it. And Linda Braun is on our team, if you know her. Crystal Martin's on our team, she's an academic. Um, and, and, and so we're now, uh, end of last year, beginning of this year, we, we've begun to deliver Code Club at 50 of the smallest and most rural libraries in the country. And I couldn't be more excited. Uh, and maybe you relate. This is a, a webinar about the small library specifically. So maybe you relate with um, some of the problems that they're encountering. And um, it, we're so passionate about it. If you dig in back to those jobs numbers or uh, that one in four schools are running Code Club, if you dig into that number, what you learn is that even the schools who are teaching computer science, most of it's in more affluent and suburban communities. Um, so in rural America, there are almost no opportunities for coding. Um, so to do this in 50 of the smallest and most rural libraries in the country, oh man, it gets us fired up. We're so excited about it. So um, I'm excited to be on the webinar with you guys today to share what we're learning and to share some of the story and to give you some of the tools and hopefully you will run your own code club someday, maybe this fall, maybe next January, 
and maybe even this summer, you can start doing some code club stuff as a part of your summer reading program. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to introduce Jeannie. Jeannie is amazing. She's a, a director from O'Neill Public Library, um, and she's been doing Code Club for, I want to say we're starting our third year right now. Jeannie, correct me no. if I'm wrong. Third year? 2017. Yeah. 2017. 2017 you started, and uh, I can't tell you what an amazing job she's doing. The stories that we're hearing out of O'Neill Public Library are some of the most inspiring stuff that we hear from anywhere in the country. So Jeannie, um, take it away, share some of your story, just talk freely, <laughs> don't feel like you have to say anything specific, but just have fun and tell some of your story. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so a little bit, bit about me. Um, I'm uh, actually from Toronto, Canada, um, and I immigrated to the U.S. And um, so uh, here uh, um, in O'Neill, I just decided that I'm going to bring some of my, um, I work for the Toronto Public Library, and I was like, we had so much stuff going, and I'm like, I want to bring some of that into the library when I became director here. And it's just so exciting to see the faces of the kids when they come in and they see stuff that we have, and I'm like, yes. So I say that O'Neill Public Library is um, uh, the library with the little spunk. You know, we may mm -hmm. be small, but we have a lot of spunk. Um, but the one thing I have to say is that um, I was um, once upon a time surfing the net because I was trying to find some stuff to put on our library website for our kids space. And um, I don't know, I came across um, uh, Mesa Public Library and they had this thing called Code Club and I was like, what on earth is that? So I went on YouTube and started uh, looking at it. So I'm like, these kids are having fun. And I'm like, I want to do this for us. So I'm like, I, I'm like, should I notify somebody? What do I do? Who do I contact? So I did, you know, they say librarians make the best uh, detectives. So um, I went surfing and lo and behold, I found, um, I think it was either Kelly or Luke's um, email and I contacted them and I said, I'm from a little library. And I don't know if you can help me. <laughs> and he was just like, great. And I was able to, um, we actually started a little code club here and I didn't do a lot of advertising, just some of the kids that came into the library a lot and just asked them and if, if they wanted to because I wasn't sure if it was gonna take off or anything like that. It's just such an amazing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, it, it was my excitement. <laughs> so they all, we, we ended up at one point we had about 14 kids and we're a town of um, 3,700 so I didn't think that we get so many kids and I didn't really do any advertising. I put um, the, uh, uh, Luke sent me a sheet that I can put O'Neill Public Library's name on it and um, uh, so I can advertise. I put it in front of the, at the door of the library and people would go, what on earth is that? And at first I couldn't even describe what coding was but I did some looking on the internet <laughs> so that I could figure it out so I can ex sort of simply explain it. And um, when I did, um, some people said, well, my son might want to do this. And I said, well, just let him come. And if he doesn't like it, he doesn't have to continue. Um, and they, they came. And it was just really interesting to see. We had, at one point, one family, they ended up moving away. And I was so sad when they left because they really loved Code Club. Um, and um, the other thing is, um, I had a lot of fears as well. I thought, you know, are they going to want to come? Um, you know, they have activities after school, so will they come? So I had to. Ch I I chose Tuesdays, um, Tuesdays at four, from four to five, and um, sometimes they don't want to leave. <laughs> it's really funny. They're here a little bit past, and the parents will be waiting outside in their vehicles, and then you'll see a little brother or sister come in. Are you coming? <laughs> and it's it's really it's really funny when they they're into something and they don't want to stop. Um, That's a great um, problem. I, to have. <laughs> yeah, I myself have a full plate, um, and so I didn't know you know if I could do this because I'm not a 
I'm not as computer savvy. I mean, when Luke asked that question about, you know, what do you, you know, what what do you think your your you know skills are when it comes to something like this? I put three because I'm not that great. Um, and I found that I didn't really. I'm just a mentor. I'm just a cheerleader for these kids. And if and and in a lot of ways, they actually figure out when they have a problem. And I find that there's always one kid who's just gun ho to learn everything all at once. So they know a lot. So I have like about three of those kids that they know a lot of stuff. So if, if something happens, I'll go, um, why don't you ask and I'll choose one of them and they'll come over and help. And the thing that I love about Code Club is now they're like a little click. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that the kids that are in Code Club, um, we have some homeschoolers because we have people that homeschool here. Um, and we have some kids that are going to public school or the Catholic school, and they normally would not meet in circumstances, but they're meeting in Code Club, and they're forming friendships. Um, I'm finding that now we have, like, even um, one child that had been coming to Code Club for the last year, and we had two new recruits that came, and now they're, the parents are carpooling. So he's now met these other two boys, and now they're friends. They normally would not have, have met, and it's just the most amazing um, thing to see. And what I do is when they accomplish something, like they've gone to another level, I always go, that is so awesome, and we all celebrate, and it's just, we find it really exciting. Well, I get excited. And then they love it, and so I'm just like, this is so amazing. Um, I don't have time to learn all the programs with the kids, but um, because they all go through the same thing all the time, after a little while you figure out, oh, you don't do that. Maybe you can do this instead. And that's all I do. And Or I talk them through it and say, well, well what do you think? Let's try something else. And then you'll find that they sort of figure it out themselves anyway. And some of these programs, I mean, these kids are – um, I have some kids that are creating websites now, and it's really awesome. I mean, I have a 13-year-old. He's 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 doing websites. And the one other thing that I must tell you that's really awesome is we have some girls, and the girls love it. And, I mean, they're excited, and they come back. I mean, they're, you know, this one little girl, her apps are pink and and they do, you know, she's she's got all the girly stuff down. But, I mean, she is kicking butt. And she, I actually ask her for stuff. And she's telling me things. And it's just really, really, really awesome. My oldest um, child that's in the program, young lady, she is, um, she's 16 going on 17. I mean, that mm -hmm. is, you know, she's still interested. And she comes and she's not, you know, I mean, she even has a job. She comes when she, she has a day off. She just got a job this year and she, she, she comes when, you know, but she's still showing up and she loves it. She calls me and, she, you know, if she can't make it one day on a Tuesday, she called me yesterday morning. She goes, I can't make it for cold cup today, but I don't know what's going to be happening next week. And I think that's just so cool. I mean, she feels responsible to call to say, I'm not coming. And it's just, it's just it's just amazing now um i have like um what what i can say is that through prenda you um luke talked about training and training is just great to be able to have those tools um and um if i ever encounter anything and i'm unsure about something or a child asks asks me something that's way beyond my scope I just email Luke, and he can attest to that. Because I've emailed him a bunch of times to say, okay, um, what I sometimes do is just even cr make a screenshot of it and to show him what it is because I can't explain it because uh, otherwise I'm going to be right saying, um, um, this thingy goes into that thingy, and I don't know, you know, and, I'm, and I, I would say that because I don't really under sort of understand, but if I can show him a screenshot and say this is what, they, I get them to um, explain to me what they're trying to do, and then I just write down whatever they're saying, and I just shoot.
shoot it off to Luke and then he'll get back to me um, really promptly, which is really good. And then um, I can convey that to them. I even had um, a child who they lived um, two towns over. They can't come to Code Club all the time. I mean, you know, it's difficult. So um, we did an email thing where I would, um, he'll tell me what he needs to sign off on and um, I sign him off on his projects and then he does stuff at home. Now the, the, the one main thing that happens to me is um, working in a rural library, you don't get as much, um, uh, you don't, you, the internet speed is pretty slow. I think ours is 15. So if you live in a large city, oh my gosh, you don't know how wonderful it is for you because um, we we are slow. So that's the one huge negative that we have because um, they're working on something and then the internet cuts out and it says you're not connected. So we have to wait for it to reconnect and then, then they start again and, you know, God bless them. They're just, they still trooper on, they stay and, um, you know, because sometimes I have to sign them off if they've gone to another level and, and, and I'm like, Oh no. And I said, well, next week when you come in, I'll sign you off on that. So, um, we have kids that are so amazing. They go home and they will work on stuff at home. And then the next week when they come in, they'll go, Jeannie, could you sign me off on, on this? And I'll go, okay. And they're, I mean, and w if they do something and they, they want to show me, you know, they're excited about showing me what they've c created. And I'm like, oh my goodness. You and you have to be, you know, very positive for them. And I'm positive to begin with, but I mean, some of the things that these kids are creating, it's just amazing. And you can sort of, you could, I look at them sometimes and you could see them thinking. And they're just like, you know, trying to solve this. And when they do get it, it's the smiles on their faces. And, you know, they're just so excited when they leave. And, I am excited for them, um, but the the thing is just the the one huge drawback is when the Wi-Fi disconnects because we have these computers and the laptops that we use. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't really advertise too much is because I only have six laptops, and so um, and the other um, desktop computers we have is for the general public, and they're in an area that's not like a we don't have room, so it's it's in the basement, and and um, those computers. I mean, sometimes they get really busy, so I can't really lock them off for an hour. And if people come in and they want to do something, you know, so we use the laptop. So eventually, I wanted to see if I can get a grant to get some more laptops so that the kids I can get more kids. So, um, but what I have right now is pretty good and. The kids, um, the one thing I can suggest is um, when you do sign up your the kids for Code Club, just um, make sure you, I, I created my own little um, form where I have their name, their the username that they use, their, um, uh, uh, I guess it will ask for their parents' um, email and um, as well um, uh, passwords. Um, cause the thing is they have to sign up for some, for scratch or, you know, um, if they do sign up, um, for something, sometimes they forget, especially in the, in the beginning, they all forget what their, their password is and you're forever going back and changing it, um, for code club. So that's one way to do it. And, and I have that in a binder. So if they come to me and they go, what's my password again? I can give it to them and then they, they, they have access to that. So for me, I just love the idea of what um, Prenda has done for the library and what, you know, I believe in their cause and Code Club and that's why I'm doing this because I think that I want to know that one of the kids in my program is going to be a, next, uh, a billionaire. Um, so, um, I'm just looking forward to that. I'm just really excited and I love what this stands for and what, you know, cause 
I know that coding, um, I asked one of my kids, I said, do you do something like this at school? And he goes, well, we did it for one hour and that was it. We just touched on it and that was it. And I was like, wow. Um, so this for me is, is great. Mm -hmm. And um, for the future for me, I think eventually I want to start an adult code club. I don't know um, what that'll you know entail for now but i'm going to need a volunteer eventually to to run that because i have so many other things on my plate but i think we've had some interest because people are walking by and they see all these kids with these laptops and they're like what are they doing and so they they're they're curious um so um other than that i don't have much else to say other than then i love it yeah Wow, Jeannie, thank you so much. That was amazing. Let's give Jeannie a round of applause. Way to go, Jeannie. So good. I think that <laughs> I got you. two takeaways. Yeah, two takeaways from what you said that stood out to me personally. Number one, your your excitement and passion over the community that's formed. You called it a click, but that community that's formed in your code club. Uh, I made me cry. It's so beautiful. And then your passion and excitement for having girls that are engaging with this, same thing, so powerful there. And then the other takeaway that I had was, you said you had 14 kids out of 3,700 people in your town. I did some quick math and uh, basically you have 0.4% of the population that has come to your code club, 0.4%. Now 0.4% may not sound like a lot to most of you, but um, I just did that same proportion for Phoenix. In Phoenix, we have 6 million people. So 4% comes out to 24, uh, thousand people that would come to my code club if I had the same proportion that Jeannie has coming wow. to her code club. So that's amazing to have 0.4% of your entire city coming to your code club. Um, yeah, so just a couple of takeaways there. Um, all right, let's keep going. I wanna actually give you guys some valuable, like how, how does this work? What What's happening all around the country? How are libraries just like yours running code club so i'm going to teach you our model this is what we use this is what we teach i just want to give it to you as a gift today um so you're you've now heard the impact stuff you've heard the why the jobs and the life skills you've heard Jeannie's story and you're like yes i want to do this i want to make this kind of impact on the kids in my community but i don't know how to code how am i going to do that if i don't know how to code fear not don't worry you don't have to know how to code Code Club is a hybrid model of learning where the technology is going to provide the curriculum. It's going to become the subject matter expert. And you, just like Jeannie said, become a facilitator, not a teacher. There's three components that are present in our model. There's an adult, there's software, and there are kids. The adult, that's you or somebody at your library. There's software that's either Prenda or there's other software stuff. And I'll give you my four favorite free software solutions in a moment and kids, that's the kids in your community. The adult, you are not a teacher. You're not a subject matter expert. In our model, we don't expect you to know how to code. Those of you at one, two, three, four, on that scale of one to 10, you're the ideal facilitator for Code Club. Instead of being a teacher, we need you to be three things. And you actually heard Jeannie say this. Number one, we need you to be a cheerleader. These are the ones who create the right emotional environment for Code Club to happen. That happens by doing high fives and fist bumps. That happens by looking over their shoulder and saying, holy smokes, that's amazing. How did you build that thing? That's so cool, way to go. You know, you cheerlead them on. Additionally, you're a mentor. Mentors are the ones that when we're frustrated and we wanna throw in the towel, they say, stick in there, I believe in you, you got this. And then finally, you're a facilitator. Facilitators point people in the right direction. They say things like, I don't know the answer to that question. Did you try Googling it? I don't know, did you ask a friend? Oh, you heard Jeannie say a lot of this stuff already and this is part of the reason why she is an all-star facilitator because she knows what she's doing. Those are the three things, cheerleader, mentor, and facilitator. And so my question is how much coding expertise is required to be a great cheerleader, mentor, and facilitator? And the answer is none. You don't have to know JavaScript to tell somebody to Google it. You don't have to know JavaScript or Python to give a high five. You as librarians have everything you need to succeed in this model. I got this in an email back a couple months ago from a librarian and she said, it struck me that being a code club facilitator is similar to being a librarian. Oh, that's interesting. 
I don't need to be an expert on tractor repair, the history of China or cake decorating in order to help someone learn about those things. So yeah, I was going to say that from your previous slide there, um, Luke, that you're talking about, that that's exactly what, and what, and what Jeannie was saying. Librarians, we don't know everything. People yep. think we know everything. We don't know everything. We just know how to find out things. That's it. And like that, be an investigator, be a detective. And yep, that's what- I love that you said that at the beginning, the, the, or Jeannie said that, the expert detective. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, um, so that's what we need you to be a librarian. And if you can do that, um, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be able to succeed in this model. And I already answered this question, so don't feel like you have to chat that in. Um, all right, zero. so you zero. can choose. Oh, go ahead, what was that? The answer is zero. Zero, <laughs> zip, none, zilch, nada, all that stuff. Um, all right, so now we've talked about your role in all this. So I, I need to teach you one more thing. One more thing, and once I teach you this, you will know everything that you are supposed to do to run an effective code club. What do I do when they get stuck? If you don't know the answer, you, you can't just tell them the answer. So how are you gonna get them unstuck? Well, we've developed a three-step process and every time somebody gets stuck, I want you to use this three-step process, okay? Um, three-step process, you start, I want you to imagine that you're in code club and a girl over on the other side of the room raises her hand because she's stuck and you go over it and she says, hey, can you help me with this JavaScript question? The first thing I want you to ask her is, okay, what have you tried so far? We start here because kids are trained to raise their hand as soon as they get stuck and they expect you to come over and tell them the answer. That doesn't happen in Code Club. There are no easy answers in Code Club. This is a place where the kids need to wrestle with it and struggle with it before they come to the solution. So if they can't demonstrate that they've already been wrestling with it, then I would just say to the student, hey, go ahead and work on it on your own for a couple minutes, and if you're still stuck, raise your hand, and I'll come and help you at that point. So let's imagine that she tries it on her own, and she's still stuck. Now, the truth is, trying it on her own will solve the problem 80% of the time. As soon as she puts in two ounces of her own effort, she's going to figure it out. Um, but let's imagine that she doesn't, and then you can move on to step number two, and that is, who else have you asked? Just like Jeannie said, we're going to lean on the collective expertise of the entire community and get their peers to solve their problems for them. This is how the real world works. This is how collaboration happens in the real world. And we're just going to train them that this is how it works in Code Club, too. Let's imagine that that doesn't solve the problem, uh, even though most of the time it will. But let's imagine it doesn't. You can move on to step number three, which is simply let's figure this out together. Let's figure this out together. It doesn't mean you tell them the answer. It doesn't mean you hijack their mouse and keyboard. Basically, it means you get to model steps number one and steps number two. You get to model rereading the instructions. You get to model clicking around and getting it wrong and not giving up. You get to model asking somebody else for help and explaining your problem and listening to their solution. And if you can go through this three-step process, I promise you, you will get them to the solution by the end of it, okay? So that's the adult, let's talk, let's keep going, let's talk about the software. The software becomes the subject matter expert. It's what leads the learning journey. It's got the curriculum that will take the kids from not knowing anything about coding to being able to create uh, apps, websites, video games, animations, all of that stuff. It's got project opportunities in there. And the software is what we uh, used to think that the adult needed to do, but in this model, the software does it and you don't have to. That means, yeah, so you don't have to. Um, I got this uh, from a librarian. She said, we decided to have uh, final projects to show off. It was so much fun. I couldn't believe some of the stuff that they made. Just like Jeannie said, they make amazing stuff in Code Club. And then lastly, the kids. In our model, the kids get to go at their own pace. They get to choose to work on whatever is interesting to them. And it's a very social or community oriented environment. Why is it self-guided? Why is it self-paced? because we need the kids to take ownership of this. This isn't school. They're not gonna be spoon-fed stuff. They're in Code Club because they wanna be there and they want to learn these skills. So we need to empower them to take ownership. That's why we make it go at your own pace and choose to work on whatever you want. So kids are gonna be working on all different things in our Code Club model, right? So if you're familiar with Girls Who Code or Google CS First, that's a big difference between what I'm teaching you now and what those models use. Those models, everybody does lesson one on week one, lesson two on week two, and so on. In our model, everybody fans out and goes in different directions and works on whatever is interesting to them. And this is actually a more dynamic and fun and engaging environment. 
Um, this came from Zoe. She said, I like Code Club because it lets your imagination run wild and lets you do fun projects. And that's it. That's the spirit <laughs> of Code Club from the kid's perspective. So if you want to run a Code Club, here's what you need. A facilitator, an adult. They don't need to know how to code. They just have to be able to, to form that connection with the kids and be a cheerleader. Somebody mm -hmm. like Jeannie, right? You need space somewhere uh, where, where you can actually run this code club. Uh, and then you need infrastructure. That's computers, that's uh, Wi-Fi, that, that kind of thing. And if you have those three things, uh, you, don't, you don't have to have a lot of computers. You don't have to have a lot of Wi-Fi. You don't have to have a lot of space. As long as you have the minimum stuff, you can run a code club. So. Does your library have someone who could facilitate? Do you have space and do you have computers? If so, I want you to write boom baby in the Q&A, <laughs> all right? Boom baby. Yeah, let us know. All right? <laughs> um, so it works in small and rural libraries, just as I summarize and conclude today's thing, it works. We're doing it in small libraries all across the country. Here are some of our stats. Um, I shouted this stuff out earlier, but you can see where we have a presence. Um, and it, it's worth most of these are small and rural libraries. Um, here are some uh, Facebook posts. We have a private Facebook group just for facilitators and these posts all came from uh, small and rural libraries. Um, so here's one in, uh, I forget where they're at, Alva, uh, I forget. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, well, look at the kids in this small library, they're doing code club. Um, this woman, Code Club starts in 40 minutes, I'm nervous. You know, that's, a, that's something you guys can all relate to. Um, here in Marshall County Library, they had 21 kids show up to their first meeting. Um, it, it, here are kids in uh, New Hampshire, in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, who are uh, doing coding in a small and rural library. Again, same thing here. Um, in the years, just a collage of coding happening in libraries just like yours around the country. Okay, a couple free resources. My favorite free uh, coding websites, code.org. You might wanna just jot these down, code.org, AppLab, Scratch, and Khan Academy. All these are free. They all have uh, tutorials and activities. Code.org is like Hour of Code stuff. AppLab teaches you how to make apps for your phone. Um, Scratch is just a great platform for animations and games. Khan Academy has curriculum for JavaScript, HTML, uh, and a lot of other things. So jot those down if you want to utilize those. These, if you're not going to use Prenda and you're just going to do a DIY program, lean on these heavily. These are going to be a lifesaver for you. And then I've got a blog post here with uh, the comprehensive list of Learn to Code websites, and there's 30 others in that blog post that you can and check Jeannie out. Was mentioning wanting, Jeannie was mentioning wanting to do an adult version. Khan Academy would be a good place to go to for that because it definitely has, um, I've, I've used it before for things, it has a range of courses for all ages and but a lot, you know, Scratch obviously you can tell from the little kitty there, it's geared towards yeah. um, kids and teens, but yeah. Khan Academy have a lot of those classes for putting your adults into. Yeah, totally. I. I say this all the time to people running adult code clubs, and we do have adult code clubs running around the country. Um, and that's tell the adults get over themselves and get in Scratch because you're going to learn. Uh, the, it's the same curriculum oh, yeah. you teach you. So just get over yourself and learn how to code. And most adults are pretty cool with that. They don't they don't seem to mind. Um, I've got a free training course that takes everything that we've talked about today and goes much much deeper. You can check that out. It's just free. I just, if you want to learn more about how to do this, if you're not feeling confident yet, sign up for it. It's free. No strings attached. Learn everything you need to run your own code club. Prenda.co slash code dash club dash course. So check that out. Um, mm -hmm. All right. We've got three minutes. So let's open it up. For no, well, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, you go ahead and type in your questions um, into the question section. Uh, we do have someone saying um, Khan Academy is awesome. Um, and I think she said Oklahoma. That first one might have been from Oklahoma. Someone recognized, or one of those yeah, one of those libraries that you were sharing. <laughs> yeah, is it? I'm trying to remember if it's Altus Public Library or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. She said it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, type them in. We will um, we'll go as long as needed for you guys to ask your questions and get them answered. Um, either um, of Luke about what's going on, what you know, they, you, information you get from Prenda, or if you have specific questions for um, Jeannie about what they do did in um, O'Neill. Uh, if there's anything more specific or more detailed you want to know from um, her.
Um, now you had asked about people who said they had the, what was needed to set up one of these, the, the facilitator, the computers, um, oh, is it the space? Yeah. Um, and so, and now people are, uh, we had three people that said boom baby to that of people who are attending today. So that's not bad. So uh -huh. jump, yeah. Boom baby. Um, but we do have some questions here. Um, someone wants to know about Chromebooks. Do you think Chromebooks would work okay for um, a code club? Yeah, I actually uh, exclusively recommend Chromebooks. Chromebooks um, do everything you need for code club and more. I recommend them as like the library go-to laptop. They're so cost effective. They hold up really well. Um, almost everything these days is web-based, so word processing, Excel, all of that stuff that your patrons are going to need normally, they can use on Chromebook as well. So, yeah, Chromebooks are uh, a go. Very convenient, yeah. And, uh, and another thing, um, if they have, um, if they don't have a Chromebook and they have like a, a HP, um, download Google Chrome. And I, um, I just discovered like a few months ago that Google Chrome works the best out of uh, Mozilla, Firefox, or even Explorer, um, or Bing, or whatever it's called, um, when when we um, um, we're doing Code Club. So, uh -huh. yeah, great. Yes, yeah, no matter what you've got, yeah, that's the uh, Chrome is the is the go-to. Yeah. Um, and this person, this is, um, I'll just, you know, Tammy in Genoa is um, here in Nebraska. She says, you already got the grant to buy the Chromebooks and supplies to do it uh, this summer. Um, I assume, Tammy, is that is part of your summer reading? This year's summer reading is um, a universe of stories about uh, outer space and, and space-related things. Along, um, so I wonder if it's part, it will be in addition to that. Ah, okay. Cool. So, definitely. so we have another library in Nebraska. It looks like Tammy's going to jump on to doing this. That's awesome. Yeah, Great. we've we've got a a summer reading promotion. I don't want to take any time today to to talk about that stuff. But if you guys are interested in in anything like that, my email is just Luke at Prenda.co and just reach out to me and I can talk you through what we got going on for summer. Um, we've mm -hmm. got a couple universe of stories. We've got like a moon landing project that the kids will be working on and in a constellation project that the kids will be working on. It's gonna be really cool. Definitely. I know a lot of our libraries, because we're getting close to summer, have their things planned, but uh, they're happy to throw in, add in new, anything, uh, any other activities they can get. Um, definitely when the kids get into these things, into summer reading. Um, and the question someone wants to know, how much does Prenda cost to, when you actually yeah. do get into the actual service? Yeah, uh, so we our pricing model is just, uh, it's based on your population. Um, so it's affordable for everybody. Uh, it, but we price it based on your population. So again, just reach out to me. I don't want to take up too much time talking salesy stuff on this. This is meant to just be educational and helpful. So Luke at Prenda.co. All right. And so then for the smaller libraries, that's actually very helpful then to them that it would be. Per, uh, it is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Scaled down to how bit, how many, how large their population serve would be. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, another question um, that I have the the grants. Uh, I, we did promote that grant last that you were doing uh, for the the 50 libraries. Um, where I you know, showed that map of people. Was that map that you showed of the United States people from that grant, or just people using you know the? This is everybody. Where, where did the libraries end up? Uh, the grant libraries end up being from. Um, I can pull up a map for that if you'd like. They go on Facebook, so bear with me for a second. Sure. So we, we've actually got this open Facebook group, Code Club for Small and Rural Libraries, that's for the grant specifically, and people are posting pictures and updates and stuff in there. So feel free to um, search for that in Facebook and go join that group if you want to follow along with the story. And we put together a map. Eric from North Dakota State Library. Let's see if it's fine. There, there we go. So here's the grant map. Give me a second. All right. So every dot is a code club. Oh wow! Pretty well distributed across the country. Awesome. Okay. Yep.
Wilson Public Library. Looks like they're our Nebraska representative. Awesome. And um, I was going to see if they're, yeah. Yeah, I was just checking to see if their director had uh, anyone from their library had registered for today, but no. Um, <laughs> a lot of people watch the show afterwards in the recording, so um, that's all right. Great. All right. Um, anybody have any other last minute questions um, while we're chatting here? Type them into your question section. Let us know um, anything you want to ask of Luke or Jeannie or um, let us know if you think you'll be doing this in your library um, or if anyone on the line has already has also done this already. Um, like I said, COZAD, <coughs> Wilson Public Library here in COZAD, Nebraska is doing it, but I'm not sure if anyone else on the line has been doing it. Nobody mentioned that. So I think we have a lot of just interested people. Yeah, yeah that's um, great. Yeah, just people saying, great presentation. Thanks, Jeannie, for all your information. And yes, there's Luke's email address. So if you want to know um, more about um, Prenda, if you want to get the pricing, you know, definitely go to the website, the, the, what you'd mentioned there about to get the free resources and to get started and start investigating it. But if you need more information, information about what they have available for uh, summer reading this year, Universal Storage Related Things, Luke at Prenda.co. And then, um, Pricing, if you want to actually sign up and, and, and get their actual product, uh, that would be, he would be who to reach out to for that as well. Oh, and someone wants to know, um, are these slides something that you would provide or? Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Krista, okay. what's the best way to make it available? Um, if you've got it, you've got it as a Google there, just if you send me the link, I will put it up with our archive. I can link to your Google or you can send me the actual slides and I can post them here whichever works um, for you we are yeah we can do it anyway I can link to anything basically <laughs> we post a lot of our slide presentations on SlideShare so that they're shareable um, it depends on what people are using if they're using PowerPoint but if you're using Google um, slides I can just link to the shareable link for that yeah great. all right all right, well, it doesn't look like anybody has any desperate last minute questions or they want us to answer right now. I've been chatting, so that's great. Any last words from you, Luke or Jeannie, about uh, uh, coding with kids before we wrap up for today? All I, all I can say that is once you start, you, you won't regret it. The kids love it. Mm -hmm. Like Pringles, once you pop, you'll find it <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm honored to be here with you guys today. It's been a blast. Um, love to continue this conversation. If there's anything I can do to help, even just informal coaching and support, love to provide that to you guys. And uh, again, we just want to see kids impacted. We want to see kids' lives changed. And so beyond a business and beyond finances and, and that kind of thing, we want to help. So don't hesitate to reach out to us and uh, let us be a resource to you. Absolutely, yeah. And obviously, Jeannie is a perfect example of getting started. They started in 2017, and they're still going with this every year, so yep. it works. Yep. Said, yeah. It awesome. just means that you can't be, you can't ever be sick, because if you, <laughs> so if you're sick, they're like so disappointed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or have good backup, someone else to cheerlead them on for the day. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen now. So, um, yes, thank you, Luke, for being with us this morning. I really appreciate it. I know it's early for you, a little early-ish out in Arizona. And thank you so much, Jeannie, for sharing what you guys have been doing up there. Uh, if anybody does have any, want to actually talk to Jeannie, I've got a link here to the O'Neill um, Public Library website. I'm sure she'd be happy to uh, chat with you as well if you want to hear it from someone. Or also here in Nebraska, as you showed, um, Wilson Public Library in COZAD, Nebraska, is in that grant right now. I'm um, not sure how far along they are, but I'm sure they would be happy to talk to someone um, as well. Our libraries love to share. So Luke did send me the link to his slides, which I've got over here. So I will include that when I do the recording. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you everybody. Um, on our Encompass Live website, as I should I showed, um, if you, um, here I just linked right over to it, but if you Google use or use your search engine of choice, uh, Encompass Live, the name of our show, so far that's the only thing called that on the internet, yay. 
Um, nobody can ever use that for anything because it will just bring up pages about our um, program. Um, and here's our upcoming shows. But to get to our archives, I'm going to show you here. Right underneath our upcoming shows is a link to our archive and Encompass Live soap shows. Today's show will be at the top of this list. It's um, in chronological order from the most recent ones to the top. Um, should be available by the end of the day today here. I will have, as I said, the um, video will be posted. Here's the one from last week. We just had a recording from that one. We'll have a link to the video record, uh, recording that will be on our YouTube channel. And then there will be a second link that I will link directly to the slides here. So you can have access to those. And they'll both be available to you. Everyone who attended today and um, registered will get an email from me. Uh, but then we will also post onto our various social media. Well, we have a mailing list here in Nebraska. Uh, we have a Twitter feed. And Encompass Live itself also has a whoa, um, website, uh, Facebook page here where I will also post. Here is where I uh, posted about reminding people to log in today's show. When the recording is available, I will post it there as well. And anytime we have shows coming up, let me scroll down here, um, we post reminders here of here's next week's show, the recording's available or anything. So if you are big on Facebook, please do give us a like over there and um, you'll keep up to date on what we're doing on the show. I also mentioned to you here while we're on the archives, I did say at the beginning earlier, um, Encompass Live, this is our full archives here. You see we have a search feature now. Um, we can search the entire archive or just most recent 12 months if you just want current information. That is because, as I mentioned earlier, Encompass Live did premiere in January 2009. And we do have our archives going all the way back to the very beginning. If I quickly scroll down here, you can see um, we are librarians, this is what we do. We save things, we archive for historical purposes, and you will find old information on here. You'll find some, some lots of things that are good still, but pay attention when you're using our archives to the date when something originally broadcast. It may be a service that has changed since then, that doesn't exist anymore, uh, some links might not work. Um, so keep in mind um, when you're actually looking through our archives. But certain things are you know, always helpful, so, um, uh, we will always have our entire archive there um, and all of our current ones coming up here. So that'll be it for the archives. I hope you join us next week when our topic is we will be chatting with our new state poet, um, Matt Mason. He was just appointed starting this year and he will be joining us here at the Nebraska Library Commission to talk about um, poetry and how schools and libraries can use them to encourage literacy um, in the state. He is a state poet for, I believe it's five years, a five-year term. So he will be with here with us along with um, Chuck Peake was one of the selection committee members and are just recently, I think last year, appointed uh, Reynolds Chair of Poetry at the University of Nebraska in Kearney. Uh, Brad Modlin will be online with us as well to talk about poetry. So if you're interested in poetry, uh, sign up for that show and any of our other shows we have coming up. I've got May booked and I'm filling in June, July, and summer shows. So keep an eye on the schedule here for anything, any new things that are added. And that, thank you so much, Jeannie. Thank you, Luke. Morning. Morning. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.